they're trying to you know keep it going. So sure. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So let's Just some of the classes just ended well. Oh, so that's people see. come in late. I see. This is <laughs> and quite friendly. The friendly one. Good morning, uh, or good day to everyone uh, joining us online. Uh, welcome to the Critical Issues Confronting China series. Uh, my name is Mark Wu. I'm the director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. Uh, I think many of you will know, uh, but uh, we our mission here is to support the study of China in all different elements and aspects, uh, including but not limited to contemporary issues. Um, and uh, so this series, though, was founded uh, by the late Ezra Vogel, along with uh, Professor Bill Shao and Bill Overholt, both of whom are here with us today. And the idea behind this series was to focus on issues which are at the core of what China is confronting. Um, in other words, here at the Fairbanks Center, we study um, lots of different areas, including uh, how history informs China studies, how the humanities informs China studies, but also one of the things we focus on is what China is facing today and what that might mean for the future of what China will face. And our mission here is to promote a spirit of intellectual exchange and dialogue. We believe uh, that that dialogue is more important than ever in the times that we face today. And we believe in bringing a variety of different voices, uh, not limited to just academia, to help contribute uh, to that dialogue. And so I'm pleased, especially today, to welcome Leeling Wei from the Wall Street Journal uh, to speak with us uh, as somebody whose voice um, can add to a topic that we all know China is facing, which is um, how China's um, private businesses are responding uh, to Xi Jinping's uh, state capitalism or the growth of the new China um, prosperity economic model, uh, however we may wish to phrase it. We all know this is an issue. Uh, that private businesses are facing, but it's one where very few private businessmen would be willing to come speak uh, in an open uh, environment. And so uh, we thought to ourselves, what's the best way by which we can promote that discussion? And so we thought, well, if it's hard to get someone here to speak from a first person perspective, we do know the person that they oftentimes are very much willing to speak to and who can provide probably as deep a second person account of this as possible. And that person disappears on the main way. Um, so I'll introduce her in a minute. Uh, but what I wanted to say uh, is also um, the other person speaking here, for those of you who are regular attendees of the series you know very well, which is Dinda Elliott, uh, who uh, herself is a renowned journalist of China and can also talk about old, uh, old renowned. <laughs> There is. <laughs> well, um, and we're now trying to, but also now fortunate for all of us at the center to be the executive director of the Fairbanks Center and can also uh, speak to uh, how we think about these issues, but also uh, how journalists process what they're being told uh, by kind of this has been by regulators on the line and how we think about taking that narrative. So I uh, want to say to those of you who are here, we all know this issue is one that's really confronting the leadership as it sets into its term. And I think we have a fascinating discussion here today about, about this 
set of issues. Before I dive into using link, I do want to also put in a plug for upcoming talks that we have here at the Merit Center. And I'm going to highlight three of them that I think are linked particularly to today's topic. Um, the first is on November 15th, next Tuesday at 4 o'clock p.m. I kind of economy metric series um, in um, your particular aspect of the economy that we know is a critical for China. And that's looking at the so that food is not here. Uh, it's not a useful plan. It's the national studies. Um, but we see about that advantage for the ingredients for seeing. Uh, next week, next Wednesday at this time, uh, we we'll also have this kind of advice. Uh, I think it's well known to many of you. Uh, now, we just recently served to sit in the U.S. State Department. She'll be here to speak about how to avert crisis in Taiwan and to stabilize U.S. tensions. And then finally, I just wanted to bring your attention for those of you who are not yet aware of it. Do not do this on the first time for this speech on your attention. The next day conference. Um, that's being hosted by the Fairbanks Center in conjunction with the Ash Center at any school entitled Coexistence 2.0 US China, which is in the changing world. And I such a one for those of you who are non proper attendees who wish to register for this, to please do so because it's tremendous uh, thanks to your capacity at some point for that conference. If uh, you're not a proper attendee holder, I'm already done, please do register. Um, these can all be found on the various events website. And again, we're talking about all three of these events be making this next week. Um, so it's my pleasure right now to introduce Li Wei. Li Wei is the chief China correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. Um, she loved in China, but uh, her um, journalism experience is here in the United States, where she began her coverage here in New York um, and uh, earned a journalism degree at NYU and then joined the journal and was assigned uh, to basically cover charges, particularly folks in China school. And so she was at the heart of those discussions. Those of you who follow um, U.S. China relations uh, know that Lily and her team uh, have very much been provided a play by play coverage of what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and provided uh, that. Unfortunately, given rising tensions, um, she and many others were asked to leave China 20. She did not base in New York, but that has not really stopped her ability to cover these issues as closely as. She hasn't been doing that. I think that's one of the wonders that I've always had. Um, in fact, sometimes I forget that she's a state of New York and simply not just in Beijing, getting all well, the sources of information. Coverage last year, uh, her, her and her team, uh, I know mean, it's coverage of her quote of Bicycle. So I think it speaks deeply to how uh, much uh, she's revered uh, by her fellow peers on uh, the coverage. It's absolutely a uh, focus. Uh, she's the author of a book that, for those of you who do want to understand how we got to a trade war and what might emerge from that, she and her uh, fellow uh, street journal, Bob Davis, uh, her, her super card show that uh, that does connect with all of that. Um, so, Ling Ling, it is my pleasure today to welcome you to Harvard. Thank you for joining us. Please join me. Anyway. Okay, great. So I'll just jump in first to say that um, saying that if she was Ling Ling was asked to leave China is a very polite way of putting <laughs> the fact that, it, that all the journalists were expelled. But anyway, um, so Ling Ling, I will just add in my two two cents, um, which is that she is the smartest, best sourced uh, China reporter I know. And I will tell you from my own experience that it is very, very hard to cover China. And um, I remember I was covering China back in the late 80s, from 86 to 90. And I remember literally sneaking around under cover of darkness, trying to talk to the liberal reformers who were building, you know, sort of the new China and, and struggling to figure out what, what policies should be. But at the same time, knowing that the other side were not talking to me. 
right? So the people who were talking to me were only the ones who wanted to be talking to the Western journalists. And so it's very, very hard. And I will add to what Mark said, which is just your ability to, we'll get to that in a while. I think your ability to continue covering um, China from outside of China is really very amazing. So um, so let's jump right into the latest news. I mean, let's start with the Party Congress. So much has been said and written about the fact that um, this was a clean sweep for Xi Jinping, right. and he basically eliminated anybody who had opposing views um, from the top levels of the government. And, you know, more than a few Chinese friends have said to me that they've noticed that there's kind of nobody at the top who is good at managing the economy or is, is expert at managing the economy. So I'm just wondering what you're seeing in terms of signals coming out of the, China, the out of the Party Congress on what economic policy and the party's attitude towards business in particular might be right now. Sure, um, it's really um, my honor to be here. Uh, I grew up in China uh, in eighties and nineties, um, and I have seen some you know uh, Chinese faces here. Probably know that. I'm among the generation that harbored this Howard dream. I've told Dina many <laughs> times, you know, it would be, you know, uh, amazing if I ever can come to Harvard and study. And, and so I'm, I'm just extremely honored for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Mark and Dinda and Bill and Bill and Winnie. And um, I met so many, you know, legends here already um so here also this is the chance for me to actually um study from you know learn from all of you and the, the questions you're interested in and to the extent that i can give some really good answers i'll be you know very very happy and she's starting her kid out yeah her son so <laughs> nine-year-old son is sitting up there so <laughs> exactly we welcome him too <laughs> that's my plus one he's getting some much needed harvard early harvard education <laughs> uh, so um Yes, the Party Congress, Dinda, as you pointed out, is a you know clean victory for Xi Jinping. It really marks an end to any kind of resistance to Xi, to his dominance in Chinese politics, to his policies. Um, so you know, for me, you know, because I've covered the intersection of the politics and the economy for the past ten years, what ex extremely even more striking is the fact just as you pointed out, all those pro-market pragmatists who for years basically powered China's integration with the United States and the rest of the world economy, all those people are gone. Not just the Premier Li Keqiang, the Wang Yang, but some of the people lower level, right? Liu He, uh, Guo Shuqing, the current banking regulator, Yi Gang, the current uh, central bank governor. So all those people, um, you know, the familiar faces for a lot of uh, policymakers in Washington, in Brussels, uh, in uh, Tokyo, in Seoul, all those faces are gone. Um, to me, it really is a true changing of the guard uh, in terms of China's orientation with the rest of the world especially the U.S.-led West. Um, so, you know, um, that just, to me, that's, you know, more striking even than the fact that, you know, is a clean sweep for Xi, because we all know, you know, he was going to get a third term. We all expected that, but we didn't expect him to basically um, completely break the norms um and 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 you know having such a um now having such a team that really just packed with loyalists to the party actually to himself personally um so that really um you know if you consider uh take into account the personnel changes and then look at what he actually said during the party congress, the political report he delivered. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that, the, that he has uh, changed the central task of the party from the previous decades when um, the leaders like Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, you know, put 
economic development at the center of the party's task. And nowadays, it's more about security, right? Uh, the emphasis on secure uh, security. It you know all, it kind of you know suggests that he's trying to rewrite the social contract with the Chinese population because before, in the previous decades, it was legitimacy. Uh, performance legitimacy, right? As long as the party keeps delivering higher growth, more prosperity for the Chinese population, and nobody would say a thing about the party continued rule of the country. And now, you know, it is more like, okay, our legitimacy now relies on, you know, keeping the Chinese people feel secure. Uh, secure from Western influences, secure from the perceived, especially the perceived threats from the United States. So that's my biggest takeaway from the Party Congress. Right. Okay. So before we jump into, you know, drilling down into the private sector and what's happening with them right now, I, I just have to ask you what the heck happened with Hu Jintao. So we all watched in amazement um, as he was removed, the former party secretary was removed clearly against his will. Um, from the Great Hall of the People, just near the end of the Congress. So, tell us from what you are hearing, what happened, and um, what was about to happen at that moment. You know, what what what's the story that you're hearing? Sure, Dinda. Um, wish I knew the uh, you know most accurate answer here, but um, you know, the, I have to be really um, uh, honest about this because you know there. Are different versions floating around. Um, and uh, we may never know the truth. Uh, but, you know, based on some conversations I have had with uh, contacts back in Beijing, you know, one version that I think is probably a, a little bit more authoritative than others is uh, is such. So basically, um, uh, Xi Jinping was uh, the one who actually invited Hu Jintao to the last session of the party congress. And, you know, as evidenced by the fact that Hu was actually arranged to, to be sitting right next to Xi Jinping, you know, uh, the uh, previous uh, uh, predecessor, Jiang Zemin obviously didn't show up probably for health and other reasons, but, you know, having Hu Jintao there definitely was considered as, you know, bolster, further bolster to Xi's authority and image. Uh, but obviously, uh, and then as uh, as that uh, session progressed, you know, uh, one uh, big puzzle obviously involved that red folder that was uh, right in front of Hu Jintao. And it looks like from the video we saw, it looks like Hu Jintao tried to open that red folder. So the question, obviously, we were just talking about it yesterday, what was in the red folder? I mean, um, my, some of my colleagues did this amazing job. They like really magnified the <laughs> frame. And 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 found out that it was a list of li names, you know, list mm -hmm. of the central committee mm -hmm. names. So you know, the, um, uh, but but that's puzzling, right? I mean, as a former top leader in China, he should have known who made the cut, right? That was the norm. Uh, party elders um, were always consulted with when you know. They tried to, you know, decide who would go into the next leadership lineup. But then you read this uh, official account from Xinhua, you know, clearly laid out the process of the leadership selection. Um, and looks like this time around, the party elders were not involved in the leadership selection process. So that means, you know, uh, perhaps who didn't really know in advance who actually made the cut and helped explain the urge to open the folder, uh, you know, and, and, and check the names. So again, this is just, you know, one of the speculations mm -hmm. out there, but I thought was, you know, more credible than a lot of others. But anyway, so, but the time was not there yet for him to open the folder. Then that's why you saw uh, the guy who sat right next to him, Li Zhanshu, Li Zhanshu. head of the legislature, tried to stop him. But he pretty adamant, right? He was, you know, I, I really wanted to see. And then 
at that point, uh, Xi Jinping himself intervened and called in one of the, you know, um, security people to try to get uh, Hu Jintao out. Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, people saying, oh, Hu Jintao was so senile, you know, he was mentally not very clear about what's going on. But you saw his you know, movements, right? And he really resisted from being dragged out from his seat and um, made some uh, very clear um, gestures that he didn't want to leave. But of course, in the end, he had to, he had to go. Uh, but he was, but from, from every movements he made, from the time he was asked to leave to the time he actually walked out, I didn't see any sign of a person who was mentally ill or incapable of doing his own stuff. I saw some person who was uh, jacked out uh, against his will. So um, again, you know, question was, why was he asked to leave, right? Um, and, you know, again, we shouldn't really know what's going through Xi's mind or Hu Jintao's mind at that point. But I have to say that um, Hu Jintao is known as this bland figurehead in China, but he actually took actions on his own uh, that was surprising before. That was uh, uh, 10 years ago when Xi Jinping was anointed as the top party leader. So that was uh, in November of 2012. And Xi Jinping and the six of his colleagues, the new standing committee was about to make a press appearance. Um, and they were an hour late. So uh, as a reporter, you know, we were all there wondering what happened. Maybe just, you know, nor but, you know, normal delay or whatever. But then we only found out later it wasn't normal delay. It was because right before the press appearance, uh, the the new leaders and the pre predecessors, uh, including Hu Jintao and Zhang Zemin, they they had a closed door meeting themselves first. And during that meeting, Hu Jintao took the initiative and announced that I am going to relinquish all three positions, not just president and party chief, but also military position. And that was really a surprise decision because Zhang Zemin the uh, predecessor to who had held on to the military position for longer, right? And interfered with Hu's uh, leadership for 10 years. So when Hu announced that decision, surprised the decision, and uh, you know, it was told by people who actually attended that whole thing, you know, Jiang Zemin's jaw just dropped. But, you know, it almost, the decision almost moved Xi Jinping to tears because it really helped and pave the way, right? Secure power and consolidate power. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so yeah. if you think about what Hu Jintao did 10 years ago, and then fast forward to a few weeks ago, the resistance he had shown at the party congress, it, it just, you know, it, it's just really amazing right stunning what you know what what he did and then arguably he probably also figured that was his last chance to make a statement you know that could be seen by many more people mm -hmm. as opposed to close story inside home or doing what 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 and not right so i i <laughs> I, I thought that explanation from some party insiders in Beijing, what was, you know, credible in a way. Uh, but, you know, the fact that she asked him to leave also shows, you know, the, the need to keep, maintain, you know, his authority, the, the image, you know, no one is allowed to violate any kind of procedure, any kind of rules, you know, even if you are, you know, my predecessor, you have to leave. So... That's, That's my yeah. very very yeah. long Thank you for that amazing answer. Amazing, uh, amazing answer. So so let's turn to the topic of the day, which is the private sector. Um, you've written a lot about the rise of the private sector in China and also the challenges that they have been facing. Um, and so I, I'd love to ask you, you know, to talk about what you're seeing in the private sector more recently, um, and what you think Xi Jinping is trying to accomplish as more funding goes to the state sector. 
Sure. Um, the uh, crackdown on the private sector really has been going on for quite a while. And just, you know, it has accelerated um, in recent years, especially 2021. You know, we saw this uh, enormous pressure on platform companies like Alibaba, Tencent, you know, the kind of companies that have huge, um, you know, um, uh, stockpiles of data. Uh, and, um, you know, we have saw, uh, saw uh, seeing uh, private business people like Jack Ma used to be idolized in China, right? And almost now, nowadays has vanished from uh, from public view. So it, it's, again, it's also really puzzling for a lot of, uh, especially Westerners who knew how private sector really powered China's growth uh, for so many years. We, you know, whenever... I remember my 10 years back in China, when, whenever we uh, interviewed the private entrepreneurs, they were always so hopeful, mm -hmm. the kind of unbridled energy, right? Mm -hmm. The kind of uh, um, desire to innovate, to compete, to grow. It was just enormous. But why would Xi Jinping want them to, um, you know, want to crack down on them? You know, uh, one explanation, um, and it's, it's pre-reported, was that, um, you know, for, for Xi Jinping, really, politics is in command, uh, not, um, you know, economic development. So he has this huge desire to make sure that all private businesses of all sizes of, in all sectors fall in line with what the party wants uh, for the country. And um, that has led to, um, you know, stricter rules, uh, restrictions on the kind of uh, lines of businesses private companies can operate in, um, more private companies setting up party committees. And um, in and and also, you know, we have seen private companies having to tailor their business models to suit the needs of the state. Can you share any examples of of companies that have been struggling with this? Where and and what happens to them? How do they navigate this? You know, if they have to have a party uh, committee and you know all this, how how do they deal with it? Sure, that's a great question, Dingda. You know, we have seen that, um, you know, for example, the most well-known ones, right, Alibaba, Tencent, you know, they have been gradually divesting uh, instead of uh, expanding further, been shedding assets, non-core assets, uh, especially getting trying to get out of the uh, areas that are seen as uh, venturing into the ideological domain of the party, uh, information, right, uh, media, that kind of stuff. And, um, uh, you know, we have seen the state um, government, be, be it local government or central government uh, ministries or agencies, taking very minority shares in uh, private companies, especially those with troves of data, uh, those minority shares actually empower them to uh, veto key business uh, decisions. Is this the so-called golden shares? Exactly, golden shares. You know, usually just 1% of ownership, but has veto power. Um, so, and, uh, and you know, one of the... Um, uh, for, uh, a couple of years ago, I interviewed a private uh, water uh, company in Beijing. You know, it's uh, basically in the uh, business of uh, producing uh, clean water. It was, you know, because of China's environmental needs, it was it had been a booming business for almost a decade. And this guy became one of the richest billionaires in China. But because the um, gradually stepped up state control over the economy, his, com his company was squeezed uh, for financing. Because more and more, despite the fact that the government still talks about, we need to um, 
you know, get banks to lend more to private businesses. But in reality, it's really hard for them to get money because the interest rates are usually very low, very high for them compared to state firms. Um, and, you know, banks not very willing to lend to private businesses considered very risky. So this guy, you know, he did uh, this quintessential American way of uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know the trappings of American capitalists. And, you know, he actually borrowed a lot of shares uh, himself and and tried to include uh, expand his ownership. So, but because the financing of the company was squeezed, the share prices of his uh, uh, firm dropped. So he was pressured by margin costs and all that. So uh, it couldn't really sustain the business going forward mm. and then of course at that time uh, a big uh, state-owned firm in Beijing uh, swooped in and now has already taken full control of the company and guess what the company is expanding is business into Belt and Road as a, you know as opposed to the old line of business which has proven profitable which was you know the clean clean water and uh, some kind of system that you you know households could can buy to uh, for uh, water purification mm. so now they're doing more of the belt and road investments mm. um so that's one example of how private business actually getting taken over by the state and reorient mm. its business model to suit the government oh, would you say that um private sector access to capital is the biggest challenge for the private sector or are there other ways in which, and I'm also curious, like the word, you use the word crackdown, which crackdown, that word has a judgment in right. it, right? You yes. could also make the argument as the Chinese government would, which is that the market was unregulated, it was out of control, we needed more regulation. But but I'm curious as to what other, what other um, you know, challenges is the business community facing aside from from access to capital. Sure, I I compl- I think that's a very f- fair point. Just to uh, to your point about the the choice of word crackdown, you know, uh, a, a lot of times we we do hear that from 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 Chinese officials. You know, mm-hmm. whenever we do an unflattering story, they would you know call me for tea uh-huh. uh, or something, and uh, you're hurting China, uh, but. The, the thing is that as a journalist, right, you know, our job is not to help the government justify their positions. So we're nitpickers. You know, we, we really <laughs> hold you accountable for everything you do. Uh, the, the, the Why we use the word crackdown is that, yes, every country has the problem of, exa- ex- especially in the area of data, digital trade, the US, Europe, they all have the kind of problems in terms of how to regulate digital records. In China's case, it's because, you know, they, the government says that, oh, we want to ring in those private de- uh, tech firms' anti-monopolistic uh, 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 m- mm-hmm. practices. Mm-hmm. But the irony in China is that the biggest monopoly is not those private companies, is the state sector. So there is no, nothing that's getting done. Uh, to adjust that big monopoly. Uh, on the other hand, mm-hmm. they're trying to, you know, you know, really focus mm-hmm. their energy on reining in the monopolist behavior of the private firms. So that's the that that's really um, one of the biggest ironies in in all this. And also, you know, in terms of uh, uh, data, you know, we talked about that's mostly one main area of focus for uh, government regulations this year. For sure, there's something to be said about the need to protect data um, privacy. Um, You know, my family back in China, they would be the first to tell you how often they get those very invasive messages like asking for information and that really was annoying right so that kind of regulations uh, definitely help um kind of prevent very invasive uh data collection pro- practices by private firms however the key difference between what china is focusing on and what countries like europe uh regions like europe um are focusing on is that 
China's focus is more on state uh, government control. So government has the power to dictate what data are important, what are not, and how you should disseminate, collect, store, use that data. So in China, data is considered a national asset. So that, that's a key difference. The focus is on government. I know better. I help you decide. Mm -hmm. But in places like Europe, it's like, okay, um, we need to have better regulations on data collection, the more focused on privacy. And also in China, if you are um, with the Ministry of Public Security, I don't think you would have any problem uh, accessing uh, Ling Ling's or Winnie's data. You know, you just have to ask, right? But in Europe, you probably would have to go through some court legal proceedings mm -hmm. to, in order mm -hmm. to try to access mm -hmm. our data. Mm -hmm. So that's the key difference mm -hmm. there. So actually following up on your story about the water company right. that was taken over by the state. So just last week, yeah. China Unicom announced a new joint venture with Tencent, right? right? Um, so here you have a state-run telecommunications company right. uh, pairing up with a private technology platform to work on developing internet data centers, content delivery networks, and edge computing. So as you've been saying, Beijing's been moving to exert control over the tech sector. Um, does this look to you like the sort of first steps towards a kind of a takeover? Sure. Um, cloud computing, um, AI semiconductor, uh, electric vehicles, those are all considered technology of the future mm -hmm. by the Chinese government. That's you basically, you know, in order to dominate um, mm -hmm. industrial manufacturing going forward, those areas are clearly designated as key areas China needs to take lead in. And um, instead of, uh, you know, giving private companies a freer reign. You go innovate, you go compete, you go develop in those areas. Increasingly, we're seeing this kind of arrangements in the, as you laid out, the kind of joint ventures between the state and the private sector. Um, and, um, you know, uh, this is just quite a reversal from the kind of reform that China actually carried out in many decades. Um, for example, uh, we all know the concept of a mixed ownership reform, right? It was um, started under, uh, during the Zhu Rongji and really popular, uh, popularized during the Zhu Rongji era. Mm. It was mostly about uh, private businesses, private capital, giving a chance to invest in state firms and then help those state firms operate more like commercial entities, right? Help them improve efficiency, profit, uh, profitability. But nowadays... Uh, and that the, sort of turned into, in a sense, the privatization of these state firms. Right? Exactly. A lot of people got very rich during exactly. that time. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly yeah. right. Um, and but nowadays, mixed uh, ownership reform has been redefined mm -hmm. to mean uh, state firms investing in private firms, mm -hmm. the golden share phenomenon we just talked about, you know, uh, because the, 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 the government, the state wants to have a firm firmer um, hold, firmer control over how private business are being run in China. So, uh, but, you know, so what is the, uh, why does that matter? It matters because we all know how inefficient state firms are in China. Um, I, uh, I, I got some really good data for one of my stories from the IMF. Mm -hmm. State firms in China usually are only about 80% as efficient, productive as private companies. So this kind of arrangement, having the state taking a bigger role in the economy just means China's economy is less and less in, uh, efficient. Right, right, right. So, so okay, so you've talked about... Um... Uh, critical technologies and cloud computing and semiconductors, electric vehicles, those kinds of things. And um, Xi Jinping has stepped up his efforts to reduce China's reliance on foreign technology and steer more capital into industries that it considers to be strategically important. Right. Um, 
such as semiconductors and artificial intelligence. That kind of strategic economic planning, you could make the make the argument that it's actually worked pretty well for China. Yeah. In the past, um, just look at China's EV sector, for example. Right. I mean, it's incredible. You know, they're leading the world. You know, enormously. Um, so, what do you think about that kind of state directed investment? Uh, will it succeed in in driving economic growth going forward? Sure, that's a very good point, Dingda. Um, for sure, jury still out. You know, I I don't want to, um, you know, uh, you know, declare this very moment that's not going to work. However, we have seen tremendous amount of evidence showing how inefficient the state-led model actually has been in terms of uh, trying to upgrade the industrial capabilities of China. You mentioned EV. I completely mm -hmm. agree with you. You know, China EV mm -hmm. sector has grown tremendously over the past few, few years. By the way, uh, in part thanks to Elon Musk, right? He helped build up mm -hmm. the entire EV supply chain in China, China, just like Motorola did decades ago and as apple did in recent years right the smartphone supply chain so the chinese have been very savvy as mark knows in terms of uh, taking advantage of the desire by multinational firms to get into china's markets and get them to build up supply chains that benefit domestic suppliers so but despite the progress for example they made in ev the whole industry is still very much saturated. Mm -hmm. There are like tens of thousands yeah. of EV makers in China that produce ton of cars, but the demand side hasn't picked up as dramatic. So the profit margins actually for the individual firms are quite miserable. So yes, the technology, huge advancement, supply chain set up, but... But if I'm a shareholder in the firm, I probably wouldn't be very happy, right? So, and, mm -hmm. and I, I want to just also, one area we have seen tremendous state input is semiconductor, right? Again, China has made big progress in that area. However, when it comes to high-end trips, China still very much relies on um. Uh, Taiwan firm, uh, Asia, uh, some other Asian firms and American uh, semiconductor makers and Europeans, right? Because you need a, a very built up ecosystem for that kind of technological breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is one of the uh, ideas I've been thinking about, this, this whole concept of open society. Um, you are all experts on this than I am. This is just a question I've been asking myself when doing reporting. Do, do we all need free flows of data, free flows of ideas, free flows of talents in order to achieve the kind of technological breakthroughs China is aiming for? Uh, I don't have a clear answer to that because, you know, in certain ways, it looks like even do, in, within a closed system, they accomplished quite a lot. But to get to the next level, do you have to have what the U.S. has in order to get to that point? Um, so that's basically, I, you know, it's yeah. probably a question we will find out years down the road. Yep. Um, so I'd like to open open up to questions from the floor um, at this point. And um, please, uh, if you have a question, firstly, keep it short, please, so we can have as many questions as possible. And um, secondly, please identify yourself. <laughs> okay. And then then why don't you go next, Bill? Go ahead. Yep. Change shift the US China trade So, like, one of the reasons the one of the things actually changing the And we used to have this problem when we said, are you graduating? Um, but now it's come, and we used to have a new one graduating. But now we said that we're going to be again. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> his daughter, his daughter went to Harvard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> And if you want to advise on how to advise, thank you. Thank you for the great question. Um, Mark probably much better position than <laughs> I am to answer a question, uh, but I'll try. Um, trade negotiation, th does it exist anymore? <laughs> um, you know, last year, uh, the conversations Liu He had with uh, Yellen and Catherine Tai like four times this year zero um so you ask about you know the impact of the trade war on china i, I really think um you know obviously the Trump administration the you know the biggest uh, uh, accomplish, accomplishment of the uh, Trump administration from the trade war was you know it, it basically alerted the entire world uh on some of the unfair trading practices China had engaged in for many years. But in terms of the actual results, um, I would say pretty miserable. It, it failed to change <laughs> China whatsoever. It actually caused Xi Jinping to double down mm. on the state-led model. Um, so, um, and, um, uh, and also, I, this is my, you know, personally, I, I believe that, you uh, the uh, few moderate voices, you know, the ones, the people who still, you know, advocated engaging with the U.S. because of the very heavy handed approach uh, from the trade war, I, those voices were completely eliminated mm -hmm. because then you wanted to argue for, OK, let's do this. Then you would be labeled as a traitor. Right. It's making very difficult uh, for for the you know, remaining reformist, how, however you call it, however few, to, to have a voice within the bureaucracy. Hmm. Bill, I know you had your hand up. Uh, thanks for a wonderful talk. Uh, I have a whole bunch of questions. But I'll just ask one. Introduce yourself. Hello, <laughs> from the Thank you. You talked about when our secretary or I wonder if there are other regional and sectoral variations in in how this works. Since in you. Thank you, Bill. That's a wonderful question. I'm so glad you asked. It's, you know, as Dingda knows so well, you know, China is like uh, in certain aspects, right? It's like, you know, this United Nation, right? Because the regional differences are so big. Um, so it, it might have been the case before um, Xi Jinping, you know, regional priorities, regional differences, everybody, you know, had their own priority. But now more and more, you see that he wants everyone to be on the same page, right? To be totally loyal to him in terms of what he wants to accomplish. You mentioned Guangdong, you know, the recent personnel change involving Guangdong it's hugely interesting. You know, he basically sent Huang Kunming, the guy who until recently had been in charge of propaganda to be party secretary of Guangdong, arguably one of the most uh, liberal and um, westernized regions in China. 
a propagandist. Wow. Running Guangdong, that's a pretty big sign about what the priority is these days. So, um, you know, uh, Wei Ping, just combining the two of your questions, right? About U.S.-China relationship and and the regional differences, um, so it, it seems that the one of the biggest priorities she has nowadays is to ring fence China's economic system um, and girding China for more intensified competition with the United States. That means. Um, you know, forget about the kind of uh, pra pragmatism that's been a hallmark of China's policymaking in the past four decades. It's more about, <clears throat> you know, be um, politically, ideologically pure, right? Um, instead of embracing private forces and capitalist forces, we make sure we regulate them and, and keep them, you know, within a cage. Um, so uh, all for the purpose of basically securing China's economic system, financial system, sanction proofing the economy because the intensified hostility uh, with the United States. And another thing about local officials, though, is that, you know, you must have heard the term lying flat. Um, it's you know a very passive aggressive way of expressing your displeasure, but you have no choice but just do nothing, and and she still has that problem. Mm -hmm. Despite he packed his his cabinet with mm -hmm. lawless, a lot of people on the local level, you know, they're being hunted by the anti non-stopping anti-corruption mm -hmm. campaign, and the 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 kind of incentives they're used to no longer there. So uh, on the other hand, the constant lecturing about being have to be politically correct and loyal, you know, just all those forces that play. Okay, maybe the best way to do uh, for me to do things is not to take any initiatives going forward, just lie flat, right? Um, so I, I think that's also a big problem. And and most uh, recent example is this whole COVID control measures all over the country. Okay, this is the one area you cannot lie flat, right? <laughs> if you lie flat, then <laughs> cases go out of control. You lose your job. Worst best case scenario, you lose your job, right? So, so then what they do? Okay, I can't lie flat here. Then I accelerate. I just try harder. I, I just make sure you see that I do jobs. That means excessive control measures, okay. measures that have led to many instances of, you know, people not being able to get their, um, you know, diseases treated, you know, mm -hmm. very tragic deaths, you know, pregnant women not being able to have their children delivered, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So, so it's, it's, Yes, the unity we very much saw at the very top, but beneath it, it's still pretty messy, mm. I would say. Fascinating. Okay, another question. How about this one here? Yep. So do you think that the Canadian market economy with a more state or not just state only plan economy is possibly for the future comparing and maybe she is working on the In other words, instead of reacting and talking others, we can live more like a policy engine. Using like a specific management of the economic business, for those medium and more business can people live as long as China is control of the giant company. 
Sure. And can I ask you before you jump in, just can you sort of explain firstly, is this Gong Xiao Shu thing real? What is it? And you know, is that a real thing happening, this rumor? Um, explain that and then then uh, you know take that question. Thanks. Right, right. Mm -hmm. This uh, uh, Gong Xiao Shu is kind of state uh, sponsored, state organized, um, basically, you know, uh, supply and uh, supply cooperatives, right? Basically. Mm -hmm. So um, those things were really a feature of the command planned economy back during the Mao era. Um, so I do think the most recent talks about, you know, re uh, basically setting up more Gong Xiao Shu um, is reflective of the current political trend in China. Uh, the, the trend is such that um, she definitely has this desire of remaking China's economic model to, to make it much, much less capitalist and more socialist. Uh, so he has a desire of returning to, um, you know, a lot of people have talked about differences between him and Mao. I totally agree, but there are certain um, objectives he definitely shares with Mao. You mm -hmm. know, one of them is this, um, you know, show right? Uh, make, you know, socialism really stick in China. So uh, I think it's definitely a trend worth watching, you know, how how much um, further would that go? And right now we have seen a few provinces like Hunan, you know, not, not the, the entirely backward places, actually some of the more advanced, you know, regions actually are talking, planning on that. So again, you know, what the, that, that, tells me two things. One is the political trend we're talking about. The other is, again, back to uh, the competition with the United States. So you talked about, you know, China preparing for potential conflicts, right? So in time of crisis like that, you want to be able to make sure supplies of certain essentials like food, like grain, meat, pork, agricultural products, you want to make sure that supply is there, is insured. And the best way to ensure that is Gong Xiao Shu, right? So, so those, so that basically tells me those two things. But again, but I don't want to sound like too alarmist. Like, okay, you know, they're they're preparing for something bad very soon. But, uh, but just you know, just keep reading what she has been saying. You know, just a couple of days ago, you gave a speech to the military about getting ready for battles and stuff like that you do see i mean this is not us trying to sound too alarmist here it's him actually talking more and more and more about the need to be ready for for war actually one of the things i found so fascinating about the program we had last night was tony sage from the kennedy school was saying that he felt that she's report at the party congress was a very anxious report Yes. It was full of a lot of a lot of anxiety exactly. about threats from the rest of the world. Yes, threats, struggles, right? Um, you know, the 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 storm, dark storm is approaching. Right, right. right. Um, it's it's quite dark. Yeah, very interesting. Um, another question. Let's take one from up there. Yep. Um she's like about the the low government. So some researchers theorize, theorize that, you know, Chinese rise is a story of um, even federalism, which means that the low government basically has a lot of autonomy in terms of, you know, if you look at like industry policies, like um, incentive subsidized is very small. All those are like uh, policies show that uh, show that the dropping short autonomy in terms of economics. So I wonder, like, in terms of like um, the recent trend uh, in the uh, political institutional structure structural change. How do you think that the economic local autonomy, uh, in terms of that, how that will, will change out at home, or has that uh, been changed already? Sure, um, that's a great question. Um, you know, localities uh, have had some autonomy in terms of uh, you know how how they want to develop local economies in particular. Uh, but increasingly under Xi Jinping, the whole decision making process has been 
centralized, right? I I'm not even sure there 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 are debates over especially you know econ policy anymore. Um, in the past, there are definitely very active debates over what to do: stimulate, not stimulate. You know, uh, give foreigners five percent, ten percent. You know that sort of thing. Um, no, just uh, you know, you have just to make proposals, uh, thinking that this is along the lines of what the top leader wants. So, um, you know, I talked to a few local officials uh, over the past year. I did still get this desire. Um, to grow the economy. Um, and some of them still sounded very much pragmatic. They still wanted foreign investments, but they're not doing anything because they're not sure if by actively courting foreign investors, foreign capital, that's you know good thing for them politically speaking. Um, so there, there's a loss of direction in, in, in a sense, like exactly what to do. And on the other hand, um, Xi Jinping hasn't replaced the existing incentive mechanism for local officials with anything else that's other than economic growth, right? So if GDP right? Not using GDP to measure performance. So what else? How else can can the government measure local officials' performance? Uh, only loyalty. Everybody can say, "Oh, I'm very loyal." So, how do you show for your loyalty, mm -hmm. right? So, I, I think that's um, uh, you know another another issue. You know, we need to keep a very uh, close eye out for. Thank you. I have a quick follow on that question about local officials because we have um, we actually have a, a brilliant graduate student who's working yeah. on uh, the burdens that are carried by local officials and basically is arguing that it's unsustainable, that they feel they can't pay salaries. They, the demands on them are so heavy exactly. and because so much money is being spent on COVID testing right. that their funds have basically dried up to the point where they can't even pay salaries. So I'm exactly. just really curious as to whether you feel that is that can't be sustainable, right? Exactly. So at a certain point, that's just not going to work any longer. Right. So the uh, as you mentioned, Dinda, a lot of uh, localities being slashing salaries for civil servants, right? But comparatively speaking, still better than someone working at a private firm that I just see. had to shut door, right? Right, okay. because they have no business. Um. So mm -hmm. and and if you look at recent data, the number of college graduates who want to get into government, working government surged oh. right because at least the jobs are right. secure mm -hmm. I mean, when i here fama here fama exactly <laughs> the iron ball, iron ball back <laughs> and when i graduated in i'm showing my age i graduated from fudan in 97 right we either wanted to work for uh uh foreign companies or wanted to go abroad to study or you know no, none of us wanted to work for a government. We were mm -hmm. offered jobs at like People's Daily or China Daily or whatever. It was like, we don't want to do this. But now it is, it's a reversal. Oh. It's pretty mm -hmm. fascinating. Wow. Let's, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, why don't we take, well, go ahead, Harry. You're, you're up there. So, why, yeah. Yeah. And you're, and you're, and you're next. It's, it's continued to be uh, very controversial in how it's actually implemented with uh, fiddling around the edges of uh, the efforts and, and it keeps getting confined to experimentals and so can you tell us about the politics of, of implementing common prosperity? Sure. Um, I need to sum up the question briefly or how many people are having trouble hearing it. Oh. Okay, sure. So I think the question is about common prosperity, the politics of common prosperity and what exactly the government wants to achieve. Um, you know, it, it is a slogan at this point, a very vague slogan. 
And it's it's also not new. I mean, Mao Zedong talked about common prosperity too. But for Xi Jinping, this slogan is a way of you know trying to address the increasing inequality in China's society, the haves and half-nots. You know, one of the key advantages of the socialism, socialist uh, system should be less inequality, not more. Uh, so that's basically his way of trying to address that problem. But they're not really addressing it with, uh, for example, by um, you know, reforming the tax system, right? Um, and, or uh, investing more on the people. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing more invest, more spending on education. We're not seeing more educate uh, spending on rural population, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it's right now is a slogan that really scared the private firms shitless. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, pardon my language. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because, because there, we have seen many cases scared um, um i hope this uh no <laughs> audible to to people but because so far we have seen many cases where private entrepreneurs not as explicitly but the sign was there okay better donate that's mm -hmm. that's be a good party boy you know tell the party line mm -hmm. so they're very scared that you know what's the what's the point of trying so hard to build up your business when in the end you have to share Right. And and, okay. and not the, the money not really going to the poor either. It's just going to the government. So 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 that's why, you know, a lot of private businesses in particular are so, you know, um kind of scared of, of this this slogan has become a sort of like, oh my gosh, you know, mm -hmm. as soon as they heard those two words, common prosperity, they were like, okay, here we go again. That kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. One last question here, and then I'll reserve the final question. Oh, you've got a question? Okay, great. One, one question. We don't have, we have to choose one. Soon, in, indeed. Um, you know, I, I sort of like need more data to really better grasp like exactly how many Chinese are thinking about leaving China or the possible ways of them for them to to actually do that. Um, I think you know, me personally, from the friends and contacts in China, had conversation with I, 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 I constantly like, you know, um, felt those two sentiments, two kinds of sentiment. One, exactly as you described, the anxiety, the the the, the fear that the best, uh, best days are behind China. So, you know, we better, you know, leave or some, 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 something like that. And there's also another sentiment is, you know, especially the younger generation, they grew up with a rising China. Right, they never experienced cultural revolution. They never experienced a great leap forward. They never experienced even the eighty nine. Uh, right, so China is pretty awesome. Why run? Why leave? Right, and 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 I saw all the problems in the United States and and in in the rest of the world. So I, you know, I still do need to do a little bit more reporting to figure out. Which kind of sentiment now nowadays is more dominant? Of course, overseas in New York, in Boston, Washington, you know the kind of Chinese community we interact with overwhelmingly was like, "What the heck is going on in China?" Right, but but still, we're not there. I mean, that 
kills me every day that I'm not there doing the on the ground reporting. But to 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 go back to your question, do you have any words, uh, you know, of comfort or advice or whatever, you know, for people who are here, students, whatever, who are feeling anxious and kind of don't know what they can do or what to do? Yeah, I I I think um, I think just uh, um, I know this this sounds really quite abstract, but uh, speaking from my own experience. Um, Follow your heart, follow your instincts, and it it is going to pay off. I mean, to um not inside China. I mean, country you love, you grew up in. That that's just I I can't tell you how awful that actually is. But at the same time, you you just have to be able to be in a place where your dreams can be realized and your potential can be fulfilled to the extreme. So it's a quite a struggle, uh, a lot of personal sacrifices, but but just in the end, you just have to be honest with yourself. It what it is that you really want most, and then work toward it. If you want to go back to China, totally fine, and and I'm sure there still opportunities there but with the understanding of certain more restrictions but if you want to stay here and also it's not heaven right there's so problems and the, the, a lot of disturbing things we we're aware of so not no system is perfect it's just you know whichever one suits your dreams your needs your ambitions more and that then work toward that it's beautiful I think there's a question. Yep. Thank you for addressing the competition. To any conversation, but there is a very active stream of questions online. So I just want to channel two of those questions for you, and with apologies to the rest of you who submitted questions online that we gave to you. Uh, first question is from Saul Wilson, who is uh, a business scholar here at the Berkman Center, a graduate here, at, so at Brown. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on the prospect for smaller businesses, particularly small factories, retail establishments, consumer businesses. Um, the second question um, is from Andy Zelipi, who's uh, from business school. Um, he said, uh, at loose of the FP recently characterized the uh, Biden administration's semiconductor expert controls regime as an economic declaration of war. Is that how you understand the genes? Right. Um... So uh, the first question about small businesses like restaurants and shops and all that, um, you know, I, I spent many years in Shanghai when I was uh, uh, growing up in, you know, in college. You know, I remember uh, a lot of places in Shanghai. I don't know if there's anyone from there. Um, you know, those uh, very pretty boutique shops, right? Mm -hmm. The Mao Ming Lu, Hengshan Lu, you know, just where I'm sure Ding the mm -hmm. shop there. And it's just really sad. Recently, I I've heard friends all those shops um, have gone belly up mm. because of no business, um, mostly because of the COVID control measures, mm. right? So as long as those strict control COVID control measures is still in place, um, you know, unfortunately, the prospects prospects for small businesses are not that great. We're seeing many restaurants, you know shutting their doors as well in, in cities like Beijing and, you know, a, a lot of other cities. And the second question about the uh, Washington's most recent moves to tighten uh, sale of high-tech uh, trips to China, it's a huge deal in Beijing, huge, gigantic, ginormous, and they will respond. The question is how? Uh, so as far as uh, our, uh, you know, reporting shows that the government um, uh, is doing evaluations. They're trying to uh, have a better sense of how exactly the rules are affecting China's chip making industry, both in terms of talents and in terms of actual access to technology. Um, and once that evaluation wrap, wraps up, uh, the various ministries involved will propose, make recommendations and proposals to the center in terms of how how to address how to respond but they they will respond the question is you know how so one final question um 
And it's just, I want a one sentence answer from you because we're already past the time. But so we recently talked to a very successful Chinese business, business person and asked, what does this common prosperity policy feel like? Does it feel like they're coming to get your money? And his answer was, yes, definitely. So if you were a private business person in China, what would you be doing now? Um, well, I would make donations just to be, I think, be safe is first and foremost. Make donations and keep my head down and trying to figure out ways for my children and my children's children. Um, and just, you know, there's no other way out because the party is invisible, but it is everywhere even more so these days, which is the only way, um, you know, to stay safe is unfortunately, you know, told the party why. So it's a good time for philanthropy in China. So, yes, um, yes, that's a silver Ling lining. Ling, I want to thank you so much for a fascinating, fascinating conversation. Please join me. Thank you. So brilliant. <laughs> 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 so many students are.